Some of you in this room will be old enough to remember the G.I. Joe cartoon from the 80s. At the end of each episode, there would be a public service announcement, a wee little situation offered as a life lesson. Don't tell a stranger you're home alone, for instance, which was a handy lesson for us Gen X kids because we were practically feral. <laughs> Some near calamity would occur and a ridiculously chiseled army guy, usually with his chest exposed, would swoop in to teach a lesson and a kid would say, and now I know. <laughs> then aviator shades with porn stash would reply, and knowing is half the battle, while the music swelled, G.I. Joe. <laughs> From the moment that I hit puberty, I was a regular, it was a regular occurrence in my home that my mom would read me newspaper articles about girls who looked just like me, who had been raped or murdered or otherwise done wrong. Lots of kids got bedtime stories. Mine were Grimm's fairy tales, ripped from the headlines. <laughs> Suffice it to say, I knew all about what bullshit happened to women. And so while my mom was a far cry from G.I. Joe, I found myself rolling my eyes and saying, I know a lot. Her intent was to teach me how to be careful, to protect me, a practice born of intense love and a family history that included nasty things done to women that she loved. I could have responded by becoming reclusive or fearful, but instead I rolled my eyes and let the annoyance run deep. Besides, I, I knew what to look for, and I knew the facts. For my high school newspaper, I wrote about date rape, which was an epidemic in the 90s era high school I attended. The national average said one out of every five women would be victims of date rape. But I swear, I didn't know more than a handful of girls at my school who had not been sexually assaulted by the time we reached senior year. It had been in some, I, or I had been in some questionable situ situations, but I had never strayed onto the wrong side of that statistic. Besides, I had the habit of serial monogamy, which cut down the risk. I mean, as long as you partnered up with the right kind of guy. And I mostly did. I like the misfits, but I like the misfits with honor. Thank you very much. One of my favorite high school boyfriends was the stepson of a sergeant major in the Marine Corps, and while his stepdad was a righteous bastard, the kid I dated was not. He taught me how to grapple. One time when we were wrestling around, he had my arms pinned down, straddling my chest. Instinct took over, and I bucked my hip hips up, rocking him forward. He overcorrected and rocked his upper body back. And when he did, I circled my leg up, hooked it around his chest, and threw him off my body. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I did not know that would work. <laughs> he lay there stunned for a moment, and as soon as he got his breath back, he beamed his huge devilish grin at me. That was perfect. I want to see you do it again. <laughs> you see why he was my favorite? By the time I made it to college, my confidence had grown, and I decided to see what it was like to try casual dating rather than latching onto a partner for my standard one-year contract. <laughs> I met a guy in a coffee shop near the beach and accepted his invitation to dinner. He said he would cook, but his roommates would be home, so it wouldn't be weird. <laughs> it was weird. <laughs> After a mediocre dinner, he did that dude thing where they kind of trap you up against the wall and then dive in for a kiss. His overly sloppy mouth crashed into mine, and he quickly pressed his whole body against me. It was not pleasant. I fended off the groping as kindly as possible and extracted myself, murmuring something about getting coffee down the street while wiping his slobber off my face. I grabbed my things, headed out the door. Sloppy followed me. When we arrived, I found a payphone by the bathrooms and phoned a friend, another of my high school boyfriends who was living nearby and was still an important part of my life. He showed up a few minutes later and gave a stunning performance of Jilted Lover, dragging me from the coffee shop in a jealous rage <laughs> while I shrugged my shoulders at the dude and then ran down the street giggling wildly with my friend. <laughs> he was another of my favorites, for sure. Not long after that, I met Brandon. Brandon was the kind of good-looking guy that had all the swagger and charm of a serial killer. No doubt, he set off some low-key alarm bells, but after we went out a couple times, he invited me to visit at his mom's house in La Jolla, where he was house-sitting for a while. I was not expecting the mansion that I walked into, with an indoor pool, large sauna, the kind of kitchen I would covet as an adult, and a game room with a full-size pool table at the center. 
As the daughter of a mechanic, that level of wealth was something that I was unfamiliar with, and I'll have to admit, it was seductive. I noticed some odd art on the walls, and so stepped closer to see what those gold circles were. Seven gold records lined the wall, along with a platinum and a silver, all with a well-known name attached. Is your mom, like, really into 40s big band, I asked. <laughs> My granddad was kind of famous, he confessed, looking sheepishly up at me through his shaggy boy band hair. Hold up, you're related to this legend? I rattled off some facts about the band leader, including some details I knew about his mom's upbringing. Brandon looked up at me in surprise. You, you know my family? I had recently dated a juggler I met in the park. <laughs> I explained who was crazy about big bands, so yeah. I knew way too much about his particular family legacy. legacy. I also knew too much about how to obtain a permit to juggle in the park. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. <laughs> I know your mother was really young when her father died, I responded. I imagine that must have been hard. We talked for hours that night about family expectations, his struggle with a recognizable family, how his mom handled the early death of her father, about what we wanted for ourselves and our futures. Somehow I thought that knowing this history and sharing such a meaningful talk meant that I was halfway to knowing Brandon. When he asked me to fly to his father's beach house in the Pacific Northwest with him for a visit, I said yes. His father picked us up from the airport and I instantly liked the man. He was shorter than Brandon with a kind face. They shared a similar build, broad chest, solid. Both were strong and square jawed, but his dad had a sense of humor and a playful mischief that his son lacked. We drove the hour and a half to the house that was right on the beach, a beautiful place that he was renovating, an upscale take on its beach cottage vibe. Since the house wasn't finished, our room had a mattress on the floor and lacked curtains on the window. I remember looking out those windows at the water and feeling like a fancy person, <laughs> despite the unfinished finished room behind me. Over the next few days, we all cooked together and talked. Something had shifted, though, in Brandon, and I couldn't put my finger on it. He'd always been a little broody, but that just seemed part of his persona. Oddly, the friendlier I was with his dad, the more broody part of him emerged. One day while we lounged on the floor mattress, he decided to start tickling me. I don't like that. <laughs> I responded with some playful wrestling, trying to get him off this tickle train. Brandon was a big guy, taller than me and stocky. The guy who taught me to wrestle was smaller than I am, but he was scrappy as fuck. <laughs> Regardless, when Brandon pinned me by straddling my chest, I did what worked before. I bucked my hips up, rocked him forward. He overcorrected and rocked his, rocked his upper body back. And when he did, I circled my leg up, hooked it around his chest, and I threw him off my body. I expected him to be impressed. It was, after all, a damn impressive move. <laughs> Instead, he was quietly enraged. He spun around, caught my midsection between his legs, and squeezed until all the air had left my lungs. He locked eyes with me while it was happening, his face creepily passive as he watched me struggle to breathe, gasping for air, my fists ineffective against his chest and his face too far away to attempt an eye strike or a throat jab. Darkness started to creep in at the edges of my vision and just before I blacked out, he released me, got up, quietly left the room. I skittered into the walk-in closet and slammed the door leaning against it in the dark my breath jagged and wheezy, tears streaming down my face. I kept close to his dad after that, but I didn't share the dark purple bruises strapping my stomach and back that his son had given me. Brandon never acknowledged it, and I knew that a secluded beach house an hour's drive from the airport was not the place to have this little chat. Instead, I tried to manage it like you would manage any psychopath. I also slept on the floor of the walk-in closet, tucked against the door, so it couldn't be easily opened from the outside. The night before we were set to leave, we had a bonfire on the beach. The three of us sat under a spray of stars, my back to the crashing ocean as we chatted, a bottle making the rounds. I wasn't a drinker back then, but I saw how Brandon was watching me, so I took a small sip every time the bottle passed my way. Brandon had a video recorder he was playing with, mock interviewing us both. When his dad decided to turn in for the night, I tried to follow, but Brandon insisted I stay. Brandon and his dad had killed more than half the bottle at this point, though it appeared Brandon had had the most of it. 
He turned the camera back on and pointed it in my direction, the bright light and the fire ruining any night vision I had. I don't remember the topic, but he was getting more and more agitated as he interviewed me. His questions came hard and fast, and nothing I said was right. I was trying so hard to repair, appear as relaxed, unthreatened, and calm as I could be. I really thought I could handle him. The waves roared at my back, and Brandon started roaring in my face, never taking the camera's focus off me. And then he set the recording camera down, facing me with its bright light, and he smashed his face into mine for a rough kiss, his hands on my body and tugging at my shorts. I pressed my hands into his chest and tried to twist sideways away from him, which is when he grabbed my wrists and smacked them into the arms of my beach chair. I stopped resisting. I never even said no. I just let my head loll back and I looked up at the stars while his hands roughly pulled at me and his body painfully pushed into mine. I don't remember much after that. Just the noise of the ocean and the beauty of the stars and the feeling that my body and I were taking a break from each other. I knew it was happening. I knew that it happened to people all the time. One in five women. These stories in the newspaper that my mom had read me they had always been me. And I knew it was my own damn fault. I got on a plane with a man I didn't really know and I let him take me to a secluded beach. We'd already had sex, so it wasn't like I was this dainty little virgin he was spoiling. He thought I was his for the taking. Just like all those men in all that newsprint. I made this happen. It was inevitable. And G.I. Joe wasn't gonna show up with his square jaw to save me. So I could turn to my mom and say, and now I know. Let's get something absolutely straight. G.I. Joe and his tank top wearing gun show buddies were absolutely shining us on. Knowing something doesn't get you all that close, it turns out. Knowing is only like 15% of the battle, a battle I had squarely lost. I don't remember leaving the beach. I woke up early in the walk-in closet and crept silently past Brandon, asleep on the mattress, his breath stinking of metabolized alcohol and malice. I felt locked inside myself like there wasn't a way out of this bruised body and my mind keep, kept chanting, your fault, your fault, as I showered behind a bolted door, the water never getting hot enough to scrub his hands off my body. I was numb and burning and somewhere else my mother's daughter and a failure of her teachings all at once. I packed my bag in a fog and I waited by the front door, his dad giving me sideways glances but never actually asking me the question. I think he may have known his son better than I realized. I don't know. His dad carried my bag out to the car and I climbed in the back seat, grateful that Brandon was riding shotgun and acting like nothing had happened. I even wondered for a moment if I had dreamt the whole damn thing. When his dad dropped us at the curb, Brandon went to check us in for a flight, and I picked up my bag, walking away, finding an open ticket counter down towards the end. I, um, I need a different, different flight, I said, pushing my ID across, ID across the counter to the ticket agent. It looks like you're already checked in, she said brightly. Can you please get me on another flight? She caught and held my eye, her smile faltering as I fought the urge to look away. Am I rebooking both of the tickets? No. I took a long, shaky breath, looking over my shoulder to see if Brandon had noticed I was missing, and tried again. No, thank you. Please, just mine. She tapped away at her computer while I scanned the crowded airport. Miss? I snapped my head back around to face the ticket agent. I can get you on another flight in 30 minutes. You'll have to hurry. Her coworker leaned over to look at the screen. There's a fee for a change this late. He told her. That queen looked him dead in the eye and said, no, there is not. <laughs> she handed me my new boarding pass and simply said, run. I made the flight. I never saw Brandon again. But I did Google him from time to time, as you do. He got married and became a father. I wondered if he ever held his baby girl in his arms and thought about someone hurting her the way that he hurt me. Did it ever occur to him that what he'd done was assault? By trying to keep myself safe, by placating him in the moment, did I make him think I was into it? 
that it was okay? Or was he just a psychopath who would never see his part in a bigger societal problem? But mostly, I wonder if Brandon ever saw those G.I. Joe PSAs as when he was a kid. There was one about how you shouldn't take what's yours, what isn't yours. Like stealing a bike is bad, obviously, but did it ever occur to him that you can take more than objects? What I would have given if one of those characters to stroll up the beach that night and taught him a lesson. Maybe if we spent less energy teaching people how to avoid being assaulted and instead poured our efforts into teaching people not to assault, we could knock that statistic down. <laughs> The G.I. Joe PSA covered a whole lot of topics, 35 to be exact. They encouraged a girl to learn to water ski, taught children not to prejudge others, warned a kid not to pet strange dogs, insisted you leave a burning building before you call the fire department, warned kids not to race a train, taught children how to avoid sunburns, and even explained how to use proper ventilation when spray painting. They never said a single thing about this. Thank you. That's Elaine Gingery. Give her a hand.